to know more such amazing stories from Indian history, click the bell icon and subscribe to Live History India. TCA Raghavan is among India's most distinguished diplomats. He was director of the Pakistan, Afghanistan and Iran division at the Ministry of External Affairs and High Commissioner of India to Singapore and Pakistan. He is at present Director General of the Indian Council for World Affairs, a respected foreign policy think tank. Ambassador Raghavan is also a historian. Besides earning a PhD on the agrarian history of the Narmada region, he is the author of three defining books, Attendant Lords, Courtiers and Poets in Mughal India, History Men, which is a biography of three leading Indian historians, and The People Next Door, The Curious History of India-Pakistan Relations. With his diverse experience and interests, Ambassador Raghavan provides an exclusive 360-degree ringside view that traces the roots and evolution of India's foreign policy through the tumultuous and idealistic years of a newly independent country and India's contentious relations with Pakistan and China. Ambassador, there's been a seismic shift in uh, the global landscape, of course, since the end of the two world wars, the beginning and the end of the Cold War, the superpower uh, battles between uh, America and Russia, Today, China is a global superpower. Um, and, in, in, and meanwhile, uh, the landscape of South Asia has changed completely. Uh, and it, it actually changed for quite a long time because uh, it's, it, since in 1947-48, you suddenly had uh, four new nations uh, come out of uh, an empire. Uh, you had India, you had Pakistan, you had Myanmar, Sri Lanka. That changed the uh, regional landscape, the local landscape, if you will. And perhaps more importantly, or equally importantly, uh, when we look at history, the history of Indian foreign policy, uh, mustn't we acknowledge the fact that uh, Indian foreign policy was actually British Indian foreign policy and that we inherited a lot of uh, the British Empire's uh, geopolitical and geoeconomic overhangs and imperatives when we became independent in 1947. Uh, sir, could you take us a little bit through the, these formative years of India's independence and the the birth and evolution of India's foreign policy. That is true. Uh, I mean, and there are many ways one can uh, illustrate that. But uh, uh, last year in uh, uh, 2020, uh, one way of animating uh, that was when we uh, when we talked about India having been a founder member of the United Nations. Uh, and having attended its first meeting in 1945, uh, when we were still uh, a colony. Uh, but that was also a useful point of time to remind ourselves uh, of an older history, uh, in that India became, uh, India was a member of the League of Nations when it was founded uh, after the First World uh, War. Uh, so yes, you're quite right. In many ways, uh, uh, when we began in 1947, uh, we began uh, on the basis of an accumulated uh, tradition. Uh, uh, and a large part of that tradition uh, was of individuals uh, who were thinking about uh, external policy, about foreign policy, about India and the world uh, for many years uh, before uh, we, in fact, uh, became uh, independent. But it was also more than individuals. There were institutions. Uh, there was the external affairs uh, department, there was the foreign and political uh, uh, department, there was a certain institutional view in colonial India uh, about uh, Tibet, about Central Asia, about the Gulf, uh, uh, about Southeast Asia, uh, and about the uh, Indian Ocean uh, also. Uh, the, third, the third element, apart from these individuals uh, and institutions, was the influence of the national uh, movement. And it's uh, easy to uh, overlook the fact that so many of our uh, great national leaders, in fact, uh, spent a large part or a significant part of their lives uh, in foreign countries. Mahatma Gandhi in uh, 
South Africa, but there are many other uh, examples. Gopal Krishna Gokhale, for instance, was an early protagonist of the rights of uh, Indian uh, immigrant uh, labor in different uh, uh, countries. Uh, and uh, uh, there are other examples of uh, this kind in Fiji, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, South Africa and uh, East Africa, as I uh, mentioned. So there was this interest within the Indian national movement uh, uh, about uh, uh, India and the world uh, from uh, certainly the early years of the 20th uh, century. And finally, to these three uh, elements, individuals, institutions, the national movement, there's also a great uh, intellectual uh, uh, basis uh, which existed already uh, in uh, 1947. And this was, uh, this intellectual basis was of uh, Indian scholars, Indian intellectuals, Indian historians looking at uh, traces of India in distant uh, lands. Uh, and the most uh, prominent example of that uh, is of course Rabindranath Tagore uh, and his travels in Southeast Asia, in China, uh, in Iran, uh, to Latin America, to the United States uh, and so on. But there was also a fraternity of historians who worked uh, quite a lot on this theme uh, about Indian cultural expansion or Indian cultural influences uh, in uh, distant lands in the first millennium uh, uh, AD. Uh, so uh, when you look at 1947 and when, uh, when we began, uh, all these uh, factors were certainly present as background. Considering that Jawaharlal Nehru was India's first prime minister and indeed he remained prime minister uh, for 17, nearly 17 years, uh, could it be uh, would it be correct to say that uh, India's foreign policy in those years was really a, a Nehruvian foreign policy? Because over and above uh, the accumulation of intellect and the global awareness that many in India had developed, the fact was that uh, Mr. Nehru had very, very strong views on foreign policy. Uh, indeed, even his policy of non-alignment in a way is an alignment in itself. And I, I recall another uh, thing that once uh, the former Foreign Secretary J.N. Dixit told me that while he was being recruited as a Foreign Service Officer, a young Foreign Service Officer, Mr. Nehru himself interviewed him. So if you consider these kind of anecdotes and historical realities, would it be correct to say that uh, it was really a Nehruvian foreign policy that India experienced for nearly two decades of its, uh, since its independence? Would that be a fair estimate? Well, that's many questions, but uh, to start with, uh... Uh, well, Jawaharlal Nehru was a giant, it was a, a colossal uh, uh, impact uh, uh, on modern India and the development of modern India in different uh, ways. Uh, and precisely for the reasons you mentioned, he was prime minister uh, and he was also foreign minister. Uh, that certainly uh, left an impact on foreign policy, which uh, 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 the, the best way of uh, uh, explaining or uh, defining that impact is to call it uh, Nehruvian. So yes, there was a, a great impact that Jawaharlal Nehru brought to bear uh, on Indian foreign policy in its evolution and the way in which it uh, crystallized. And a lot of it had to do with his own very great personal interest uh, in international affairs uh, and on uh, the wider question of where India had to stand vis-a-vis uh, the rest of the, the rest of the world, but because he was uh, such a giant, uh, it's also easy to overlook uh, the undergrowth uh, uh, around him, uh, and in fact, uh, the other the other thinkers, the other practitioners, uh, and finally uh, the others who uh, who disagreed very strongly uh, with uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. Uh, on the critical issues of foreign policy uh, that India confronted at that uh, time. So I think it is sometimes easy to overlook uh, the debate which went on uh, about the framing of uh, foreign policy because we tend to focus too sharply uh, on uh, the Nehruvian aspect of the uh, foreign policy. And really, I think that debate was a was a very fertile debate. It was a very intense uh, debate. 
Uh, and given the people who were involved in it, uh, and many of them were intellectually uh, of great uh, substance and of great achievement uh, themselves, and there are many names which, uh, which come to mind, but given that, uh, given that uh, debate, I think it's, uh, it's useful to take a wider view of how foreign policy was constructed uh, and look beyond the prism of uh, the Nehruvian. What were some of these uh, ideas and debates that were taking place in the foreign policy sphere at the time? Could you please share some of that with us? There were many debates, but the, the beginning point was about what constitutes India's uh, national interest. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, I think where uh, all the participants in the debate, beginning from uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, they all agreed that uh, foreign policy really is a uh, extension of your national interest. How do you secure your national interest by means of a, a foreign uh, policy? And uh, the second element on which I think there was a great element of uh, agreement uh, was that if you exclude uh, outside powers, mm -hmm from your region and from your immediate environment and your neighborhood, uh, that would be something which is in your, in your long-term national uh, interests. So now out of that debate uh, emerged ideas such as uh, non-alignment, uh, uh, but uh, these larger umbrella issues uh, actually don't, uh, uh, don't fully explain or don't fully um, don't fully explain uh, how much divisions there were over specific aspects of uh, policy. Could you? And could one you, prominent example, for instance, yes. was about China. Indeed. Now, the debate about China and how India should deal with uh, uh, China began from the 1950s, and it was a divisive uh, debate, both within the Ministry of External Affairs, as we know now with more and more papers uh, being declassified, but also outside the Ministry of External Affairs. Uh, there, were, there were many people who felt uh, that uh, Pandit Nehru uh, as Prime Minister and as Foreign Minister was not taking uh, the right uh, approach to uh, China. And this, this uh, contrarian view uh, emerged quite quickly uh, after independence. And there is this famous uh, letter with Sadar Patel as Deputy Prime Minister and Home Minister, wrote to the Prime Minister, uh, disagreeing very strongly with uh, certain uh, policy positions being taken by India with regard to uh, China. And this, the, these uh, instances of dissidence or different uh, views or, or contesting uh, the prevailing uh, view, uh, in fact, continues uh, right through. Uh, so. Uh, again, as I said, I think umbrella uh, descriptions or umbrella terms like non-alignment uh, uh, don't really capture the extent of uh, debate and discussion, uh, which really was going on, uh, not always in the public eye, but as more and more details have now emerged, uh, this debate was certainly there and it was a very strong one. Was Panshil uh, Ambassador a contentious issue? Uh, indeed, was the whole outreach uh, predicated on peace, a con contentious issue. And would India have been better off using carrot and stick instead of just carrot? Not so much uh, carrot and stick, but uh, it was really about how do you, uh, uh, this, this debate really arose about uh, from the early 50s, right. uh, perhaps even earlier, but certainly in the early 50s, it was very, uh, very much uh, there that when you're beginning on this uh, process of strong engagement with uh, China, uh, one should not overlook objective uh, factors uh, which urgently require attention. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of those objective factors was uh, the border with uh, China, mm -hmm. which had remained uh, somewhat of a gray area uh, from the early 20th uh, century, largely because of the domestic turmoil China was uh, itself uh, uh, going through, but also questions of uh, what should be our position with regard to uh, the Chinese uh, posture on Tibet, uh, and how should we uh, view that uh, that relationship and try to secure uh, our national interests uh, 
uh, with regard to that equation, the China-Tibet uh, equation. So these are, of course, I'm putting it in very general terms and the specifics mm -hmm. are quite complex and uh, require a lot of uh, detail, but these debates were there. The second debate and quite a important and big debate uh, was about, for instance, Pakistan. Uh, and interestingly enough, one of the earliest debates of foreign policy relating to uh, foreign policy was about uh, uh, India-Pakistan relations in the specific context of uh, the minorities in uh, East Pakistan uh, or in East Bengal. Uh, what should India do about the very large number numbers of Hindus uh, who were uh, in uh, East Pakistan uh, and continued to stay over there after 1947 through the 50s uh, and uh, later. Now, uh, Pakistan was, uh, again, a very, very divisive uh, debate uh, uh, in India. Not everyone agreed with uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, but at the same time, it's also easy to overstate the extent of disagreement because uh, the, the number of people who ultimately agreed with Jawaharlal Nehru uh, was in fact much more uh, than those who disagreed. And one famous example of this uh, is the uh, nehru Liaquat Pact, right. uh, which specifically focused on the issue of uh, minorities uh, in West Bengal and in East Bengal. Because unlike in Punjab in 1947, uh, between East and West Punjab, where there was pretty comprehensive ethnic cleansing in both directions. Uh, in Bengal, the minority populations in both East Bengal and in West Bengal uh, had remained stationary. They did not move across the Radcliffe line uh, in any way similar to what had happened in, mm -hmm. uh, in Punjab. So the Nehru Liaquat Pact was really a uh, the outcome of a negotiation between India and Pakistan on what should be done about these minority uh, populations and how should governments approach them. It was a very divisive debate in, uh, in India. And many people felt that uh, the government of India is not doing enough. But uh, the numbers of people who finally agreed with the government line uh, and with Jawaharlal Nehru uh, was much more than those who disagreed. So for instance, Shama Prashad Mukherjee disagreed with uh, Jawaharlal Nehru and resigned from the uh, cabinet. But others such as C. C. Rajgopalachari, uh, Sadar Patel as the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, and Sadar Patel had begun as a critic of uh, the Prime Minister on this particular question, but ended up saying that this is the sensible and the pragmatic thing to do and that I would support and that I support it. Mm -hmm. So I think these early debates were quite influential in uh, uh, both establishing uh, a tradition of dissent uh, with, the, with the prevailing uh, views, uh, but also establishing a tradition of uh, debate and discussion uh, within the larger establishment, within the government and also the larger fraternity, which was interested in foreign uh, policy at that time. Ambassador, it sometimes seems that India's foreign policy has been completely subsumed by Pakistan. Perhaps it's because of uh, the control over Kashmir in 1947 and 1948, and then you had the wars in 1965, 1971. Then you had the beginning in 1989 of Pakistan extending terrorism as, an, as a tool of foreign policy. Indeed, uh, the former Prime Minister, Benazir Bhutto herself admitted as much at an international conference in Delhi in 2003. I heard her myself. Uh, could you uh, share your views on this? And is Indian foreign policy truly subsumed, completely eclipsed, if you will, by the sort of, uh, by, by, by the aspect of Pakistan? Are we completely blindsided by it or blinded by it? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's an interesting question, but, you know, the first thing about foreign policy is that you have to deal with the world uh, as it is, uh, not the way you want it to be. Mm -hmm. So you don't have an option uh, of uh, addressing uh, your neighborhood. It is a given. You have to deal with it. Uh, and Pakistan is an important element uh, uh, in your neighborhood. So that it has formed uh, a large part of your foreign policy uh, concerns is true. You have, after all, uh, you have you have fought uh, four or five wars with it, 
you have an adversarial relationship uh, which is uh, of which has many dimensions it has a uh, strategic uh, geopolitical uh, aspect it has a national security uh, aspect but there's also a certain element of uh, uh, popular competitive uh, feelings so yes i mean it is an important element in your uh, neighborhood you have no option but to address it uh, so all that goes without uh, saying but i would disagree with the view and this view has been there uh, in the past too that india doesn't have a foreign policy it only has a pakistan uh, policy okay. uh, i don't uh, think it's uh, true because uh, as i said you have no option but to deal with the contentious issues uh, uh, and uh, very often with pakistan these contentious issues have acquired a very large uh, often a larger than life uh, uh, character uh, so uh, but to say that uh, it has uh, consumed or you know sucked all the oxygen out of the room uh, i would uh, uh, i would uh, disagree in fact what has happened really if one looks at it uh, and when one stands stands back uh, and looks at it somewhat dispassionately Uh, the pakistan issue is often or indeed like the china uh, issue these issues have become larger than life because they uh, they acquire a certain uh, uh, meaning and a certain added uh, strength uh, because they converge with the larger geopolitical uh, changes which are uh, taking place so if you Uh, if you see uh, for instance uh, uh, the india china war of 1962 uh, uh, it was a significant event in itself it marked a, a major change in our regional environment that you had a large country like uh, china with which you had attempted very hard to build up a a, a healthy relationship uh, that diplomacy having failed and china was now Uh, an adversarial uh, neighbor but that relationship broke down also uh, amidst uh, uh, you know the complexities of the uh, of the global cold war the india china war coincided with the cuban missile crisis you know which was uh, the most intense phase in many ways of the soviet us uh, uh, rivalry uh, the india china war also coincided although we didn't notice it uh, sufficiently at that time with a breakdown in uh, sino soviet uh, relations so the china issue acquired a larger than life uh, character uh, because of the wider geopolitical uh, changes and uh, uh, those changes are significant because if one looks then let's say and especially with the question of pakistan uh, in 1971 uh, yes it was a major regional crisis uh, because of the uh, federal issues which pakistan was not able to address uh, uh, adequately uh, leading to a india pakistan war but uh, the wider geopolitics of that is equally interesting because 1971 was the time when the uh, americans and the chinese uh, in effect forged a, a concert or an alliance against the soviet union indeed and uh, especially after president uh, richard nixon's visit to china in 1972 yes. well uh, during kissinger's secret visit uh, mm -hmm. yes. to china uh, and pakistan played a very important role in the uh, in the framing of that uh, uh, you know alliance between the chinese and the americans directed at the soviet uh, union and that led to the india soviet uh, mm. uh, act of uh, friendship and uh, peace and uh, friendship so so the wider geopolitics gave the india pakistan issue uh, a much greater uh, a much greater much stronger cutting edge uh, in many ways and you find the same pattern uh, repeating uh, itself i mean you you referred to the 1980s and the and the use of terrorism as an instrument of uh, state policy in, by pakistan but again one has to see the wider geopolitics of it and the wider geopolitics really begins with 1979 uh, 
Afghanistan. 1979 is a defining year for uh, Indian uh, uh, national security because you know you have you have you're surrounded by multiple events, uh, and it would be a fascinating exercise to try to see whether people at the helm of affairs at that time, uh, because it was also a time when uh, you know governments were changing. There was all kinds of domestic political chaos, but how many people saw this wider geopolitical change? with uh, the revolution in Iran, uh, the Islamic revolution in Iran, mm -hmm. the, the emergence of uh, uh, Islamic uh, extremism in Saudi Arabia, uh, the Soviet invasion, invasion of, of Afghanistan, Afghanistan. Indeed. the, the Indeed. China, uh, Vietnam border conflict, uh, uh, and uh, with Reagan and Margaret Thatcher coming to power uh, in the West and you know, embarking on what we now call globalization. So, uh, so uh, 1979 uh, is really critical to understanding what happens in the 70s and uh, 80s. And it becomes, uh, becomes clear when we look at 1989. 1989, we all know, is the year uh, in which the insurgency began in Jammu and Kashmir. Yes. Uh, you have uh, large numbers of minorities being ethnically cleansed uh, from uh, the Kashmir uh, Valley. It's a period of intense uh, tension in India-Pakistan uh, relations. But it's also the year in which the Berlin Wall uh, comes down. The Definitely. Soviet Union withdraws from uh, uh, Afghanistan. Uh, you know, there's the, the Soviet Union also is showing signs of uh, internal uh, fragmentation. So, uh, so this wider geopolitics uh, gave to the India-Pakistan issue its cutting, uh, its cutting edge. Uh, and it acquired a larger than life importance uh, for precisely that reason. Uh, and in fact, there are any number of examples of this kind where you see uh, what we think now is a specific issue pertaining to one neighbor uh, or to a specific South Asian uh, regional tension. Uh, in fact, being the reflection of uh, much more fundamental and more structural uh, tensions uh, at a regional and global level. How did all these global developments uh, shape India's worldview? The disintegration of the Soviet Union, uh, you know, uh, was a very clear sign to uh, to everyone uh, who was thinking about these issues then uh, that we could not go on dealing with the world in the same old way. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, uh, this thinking amongst people who used to uh, engage with uh, foreign policy uh, issues coincided also with a, a fundamental rethinking amongst uh, Indian uh, economists mm -hmm. that uh, uh, the changes which had taken place uh, in our uh, uh, global, in the, national, uh, uh, in the international environment meant that we had to change course in uh, domestic economic policy. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I mean, so in 1992, you have these two, uh, these two separate streams of thought uh, coming uh, together. Uh, and uh, you have uh, the opening up of the Indian uh, economy uh, and simultaneously uh, looking at the world, not just in political or security uh, terms, but also in terms of economic partnerships. Mm -hmm. uh, and principally, this was one of the constituents of the Look East uh, uh, policy uh, at that uh, time that, uh, you know, the world had changed. You could not go on believing that uh, uh, the same old policy approaches would work. You had to radically re revamp your economic, uh, domestic economic policies, and you had to radically revamp your external uh, policies. So uh, certainly in the early 90s, you had this convergence of uh, radical rethinking uh, in uh, different, from different uh, uh, points of view. But it did not mean that you, know, uh, you could reimagine your, uh, your neighborhood. Your, the neighborhood issues have a certain, uh, have a certain uh, standing in their own right. And while they may get influenced by what is happening uh, in, the, in a wider environment, uh, 
those issues don't uh, disappear. So you have, uh, again, in that same time, late 80s, early 90s, very difficult issues with regard to Sri Lanka. Uh, numerous problems in uh, your approach to uh, Pakistan. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very grave difficulties uh, also with regard to uh, Nepal, because Nepal was also going through an internal uh, turmoil uh, in that sense. Now, each of these specific issues were impacted also by the wider geopolitical shifts, the end of the Cold War, uh, the fact that you had the United States emerging as a, uh, as a hyperpower, uh, including in, uh, uh, in Asia, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But the neighborhood issues retained their uh, own role. And that is, uh, I think this is what I believe that no matter how much you can uh, try to deal with uh, the rest of the world as if your neighborhood doesn't exist, in the end, your neighborhood will come back and tell you, uh, I'm still there. And a large part of your attention has to be focused uh, on us. Speaking of neighbors, Ambassador China, uh, in India, it's difficult to not keep returning to China considering how large it looms over India's foreign policy even to the present day. And I mean, here I wanted to talk about uh, some aspects of history as well. The thing is that, you know, these lines on the map, like the McMahon line uh, and uh, other demarcations in, in the northwest of India, uh, these were drawn several years before India's independence. India inherited these decisions, these cartographic decisions, if you will. And I, that, that is one aspect. The other aspect is that, uh, I mean, what were Mr. Nehru's views on this? I mean, did he inherit and absorb and imbibe the British worldview uh, of China and Tibet, which led to Mr. Nehru's own worldview about China very, very quickly? Uh, did he, uh, for instance, understand the way the British understood it? And did he try to check China in his own way? Uh, or was he also, uh, like in the present circumstance, trying to deal with China with uh, sort of a, a kind of a peace approach, if you will, a detente as well as uh, keeping conflict on the side in, in a way that um, Rajiv Gandhi carried on doing, say, in 1988 when he visited China, 34 years after his grandfather did. And also uh, the Prime Minister P.V. Narasimha Rao, who visited China in 1993 for a series of landmark negotiations and declarations uh, aimed at bringing India and China closer and minimizing the aspects of conflict. So given the context of the present day and given what we have seen in 2020 with the fracas in, uh, in the Galwan Valley, uh, in the Pangong Lake area in Ladakh, and the continuing uh, conflict and, and, and irritations along the border with Arunachal Pradesh, could you share with us your thoughts on what to me at least seems like a strategy of talk, talk, fight, fight, as it's sometimes said. Uh, because for many people in India, uh, it's very mysterious. I mean, why would we be fighting with somebody and be doing investment with them? With them? Why would we be uh, engaged in conflict with somebody and yet in, invite investment from, the, from them? So could you clear up uh, this a little bit for, uh, for us? Well, you know, there are always strong continuities. Yes. There are also changes. Uh, the British, uh, like all imperial powers, yes. uh, you know, they're obsessed, uh, they were obsessed with uh, uh, cartographic uh, certainty. Mm -hmm. uh, and they thought uh, uh, your the empire's security is secured by uh, cartographic uh, uh, certainty, but they were dealing with the China, which was a weak power at that time. Mm -hmm. It was internally uh, divided and uh, the historical record shows that the British focus was always much more uh, on the Soviet Union mm -hmm. as a strategic uh, threat. Uh, and later, uh, uh, as uh, uh, in the 50s and 60s, as part of the wider Cold War, uh, the West started viewing the Soviet Union and what it did with in China and what it did in Asia through that prism of uh, Cold War uh, dualities. Uh, I think for us, yes, in the 50s, there was always a recognition that China is a large neighbor. Uh, and it was important uh, that you have a, a substantive and healthy relationship with your uh, neighbors. Now, that is a position which is prima facie an acceptable one. 
right. a developing country like India to want to have an environment, a regional environment, uh, and a neighborhood which is uh, largely at peace uh, with itself uh, is not an objective anyone can have senior, serious disagreements with. Mm -hmm. uh, because unless you secure your uh, uh, a stable uh, regional environment, you will not be able to focus on your national developmental issues, which are really the priority for the uh, country. How do you develop your economy? How do you deal with issues of health, unemployment, uh, uh, education, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So a meaningful relationship with uh, between China and India made sense uh, uh, in that context. And therefore, despite the breakdown in relations which took place in the early uh, 60s, uh, uh, in the 80s and 90s, you find great efforts being made, uh, both by India and also by China, to try to secure that relationship uh, again, to try to reestablish some basis uh, of strategic uh, trust. But you see, the situation has changed a great deal since then, uh, and especially uh, in the last uh, two decades, because you are now dealing with China, with a China which is qualitatively different. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that qualitative difference uh, uh, emerges out of its uh, phenomenal economic uh, performance since the early 1980s. That economic uh, performance has powered China into becoming uh, a great power. And the situation you confront today uh, is that you're dealing with a great power uh, with which uh, you are in uh, immediate proximity. Mm -hmm. now, this is a new situation uh, for us uh, in many ways. You're not, uh, you're not dealing with superpower rivalries or of great power tensions from some distance away. You have a great power in your immediate proximity with which you have a history of adversarial relations. So, you know, that throws up uh, issues which are qualitatively uh, different uh, and require therefore that much more uh, careful and sensitive uh, handling. It's no longer a um, academic issue uh, for us. It's, uh, I mean, I keep saying that Australia talking about China or the United Kingdom talking about China or even the United States talking about China is qualitatively different from India talking about China because the realities we confront are uh, quite different. Indeed. And it requires therefore much more careful, that much more careful and sensitive handling. Ambassador, if you could move from China to the Indian Ocean, but even though in the Indian Ocean is difficult to get away from China, especially with its uh, so-called uh, string of pearl strategy uh, and its, uh, which supplements its Belt and Road strategy, in a way oversee and land a girdling uh, Asia from East Asia across uh, the Bay of Bengal to West, through Pakistan and onto West Asia and the Eastern seaboard of Africa. So is this ocean, the Indian Ocean, which came to be called the Oceanus Orientalis Indicus in the 16th century onwards or so. Uh, truly the Indian Ocean and indeed, uh, do we have any claim on it uh, as an Indian Ocean beyond this sort of landmass, this peninsula India projecting into this great body of water? Uh, does India even have what you might want to call a, a golden necklace strategy to counter uh, China's string of world strategy? Could you share your thoughts about that? please? Well, you know, the Arabs, uh, uh, the Arabs uh, use the term uh, uh, Bahr al Hind. Indeed. Loosely translates to Indian Ocean, and possibly uh, they were the first to, uh, to use that term. And in the 16th, 17th centuries onwards, the term Indian Ocean acquired uh, greater uh, popularity. But the fact is, uh, neither in the 8th century nor uh, in the 17th uh, century uh, did we lay a claim to the Indian Ocean because India as we know it today did not exist. Mm -hmm. uh, the Indian Ocean uh, is Indian uh, in the same way as uh, Indians are Indians and in that a civilization has end up, ended up as a nation uh, state. Uh, 
So, uh, so I think uh, the, uh, the, the fact of that civilizational uh, influence uh, and the geographical uh, factor that you, that the Indian, the South Asian Peninsula uh, extends deep into the Indian Ocean. All of these give uh, uh, these historical, cultural, and uh, uh, geographical factors give you a certain uh, primacy uh, in the Indian Ocean. But that is not to say that you have a claim on it, because you know oceans are global commons. Indeed. And now, fortunately, we have a set of rules uh, and templates about how nation states should behave in global uh, commons. So I don't think we, uh, it would be correct to have a, a proprietary attitude towards the Indian Ocean. But at the same time, yes, there are certain influences uh, which have nothing to do with India as a nation uh, state, but everything to do with India as a civilization. Indeed. Uh, and these uh, influences you find whether you go to, uh, uh, I mean, for instance, if you travel uh, to Southeast Asia, to uh, Angkor Wat, or to uh, to Vietnam, uh, to 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 this to this wide uh, range of territory to which you were connected uh, also by maritime in maritime terms. You had a you had a territorial connection, but you also had a maritime, uh, a very strong maritime. Uh, contact and to which uh, you had a certain uh, you had a certain uh, cultural uh, outreach, uh, so to say. The same the same uh, applies to the Eastern Indian uh, Ocean. Whether you, know, whether you look at uh, whether you look at the Gulf or you, whether you look at the uh, the East African uh, coastline, the entire littoral of the Eastern Indian Ocean also has a very intimate uh, connection with this uh, civilizational entity we call uh, India. Mm -hmm. so I think these factors certainly have a role to play uh, in the worldview which uh, foreign policy uh, practitioners uh, uh, inherit. Mm -hmm. But uh, it doesn't it doesn't translate into a claim. Mm -hmm. uh, it it translates into forming a part of your worldview, so to say that uh, these civilizational links uh, are important, but they have to be also buttressed by, uh, you know, factors which play a more material role in national interest, because that's what foreign policy uh, is made up of. Coming to material interest, Ambassador, uh, if you look at uh, how India's position, India overlooks uh, or, or looks over, uh, some of the greatest trading routes in the world and uh, some of the greatest energy and security routes in the world. If you will. Now, if you keep that in mind, um, wouldn't it be prudent to see Indian Ocean as, even if you looked at it as a commons, wouldn't it be prudent for India to be securing its mineral interests, its trading interests, uh, protecting its maritime borders uh, more emphatically and extending its uh, outreach, if you will, into the Indian Ocean? Wouldn't that be the uh, way for the future? As your economy opened up, Indeed. Uh, foreign trade became a very large, very important element in your GDP. Uh, most of your foreign trade uh, uh, is uh, is carried by uh, maritime, uh, is carried through the maritime space. So uh, very clearly that becomes the objective reason why uh, Oceans suddenly mean much more to you mm -hmm. from the 1990s than they did in an earlier period. It's the economy in the end. Uh, and it's true that we are now, uh, there is now a greater consciousness of uh, uh, India's uh, maritime heritage and India's maritime, uh, uh, India's maritime challenges uh, than there was, uh, uh, let's say, before the 1980s. Again, in this too, like in everything else, uh, the China factor uh, also plays a, uh, plays a role. Because uh, with the, with the uh, enormous uh, powering up of the Chinese uh, economy, the Chinese are also asserting themselves after a very long time uh, as a maritime uh, power. Uh, 
and they are investing a great deal in uh, uh, naval assets. They are investing a great deal in uh, building up uh, maritime assets, uh, ports, harbors, you know, uh, which uh, many people uh, see as part of a grand uh, strategy, uh, whether we call it uh, string of pearls or whether we call it uh, uh, the Golden Pakistan Economic uh, Corridor, Corridor. the numerous uh, names, but essentially it is an outcome of China's enormous uh, uh, economic uh, performance. Uh, and uh, uh, so the Chinese assertion in the Indian Ocean has also uh, meant that you have to pay even more attention to the Indian Ocean because of your own dependence uh, on it uh, for, for trade. The fact that in the end, when you look at India uh, from space, you realize that it is more of a maritime power than a continent, a maritime uh, nation than a continental uh, nation. All these are factors uh, which make the maritime acquire a certain pressing uh, urgency uh, today. And this is going to only uh, grow. Uh, you had mentioned uh, the Indian Council of World Affairs uh, earlier, uh, it's very interesting that the Indian Council of World Affairs, uh, uh, it's one of those institutions I mentioned, which began uh, much before our independence, uh, to think, uh, started thinking deeply about uh, foreign policy. But in the Indian Council of World Affairs, there was a great uh, certain amount of attention paid uh, to maritime issues, which was in itself novel in the early 50s. And a lot of this was about uh, possibly uh, the first Indian, uh, certainly in recent times, who thought deeply about India and the maritime, and that was K.M. Panikar. Uh, and Panikar, more than anyone else, uh, uh, started educating uh, a different generation of Indians about the importance of the Indian Ocean uh, for India from a security point of view, from a political point of view, but also from an economic uh, and a cultural point of view. To bring the discussion to uh, India's immediate neighborhood, uh, I'd like to bring to your uh, recall SARC, or the idea of the South Asian Association of Regional Corporation, which in the mid 1980s was uh, built and played up as the next big thing. And SARC would be uh, you know, the next ASEAN. In fact, uh, in, in future, SARC would be a mini EU with common markets, uh, free or relatively free movement of uh, trade, of business, of investment, even of people, possibly even, even a monetary union, uh, union um, as you would clearly recall. And, but now this whole idea is sidelined. And is there a, is there a future uh, for SARC ambassador? And is there a future indeed for a sort of a neighborliness, if you will, in South Asia? Well, SARC, unfortunately, uh, has uh, you know, fallen on the wrong side of India-Pakistan mm -hmm. uh, issues. And because of uh, uh, essentially uh, contestations uh, between India and Pakistan, uh, the, SARC, uh, uh, the SARC mandate has not made much uh, progress. I think this was something which uh, India tried hard to uh, put in place, but uh, in the end uh, realized that it was not working uh, right now, so to turn away for it, uh, possibly temporarily, and look at other mechanisms for regional uh, cooperation, which did not include Pakistan. Indeed. Basically, the problem was that whatever you tried to do at a regional level, uh, the, the Pakistanis felt that uh, making too much progress uh, regionally without bilateral uh, progress also uh, was not a good uh, thing. So they would hold up the regional uh, uh, agendas uh, also. So you, you try to devise other mechanisms uh, for regional cooperation. BIMSTEC is an important uh, uh, measure. You've also invested a great deal on uh, working with countries bilaterally and the present government has a policy which it calls neighborhood uh, first and it's an important 
uh, policy and it gives it us this, this term neighborhood first implies a certain optical emphasis, which is very good. But earlier, in earlier incarnations, also this policy has been there, that you invest strongly in bilateral uh, partnerships. And uh, uh, BIMSTEC, and uh, there are others also, other sub-regional uh, mechanisms. There are some sub-regional mechanisms which extend uh, further into Southeast Asia, such as the Men Mekong Ganga cooperation, which we uh, just had the 20th anniversary uh, commemoration of. Uh, so uh, this is where it stands right now. But I will say, uh, uh, SARC has a narrative value, which you cannot ignore. Uh, and while temporarily you may be, uh, you may require to move away from it, uh, and uh, look at other issues uh, or other uh, mechanisms, that narrative value remains. And uh, you got a graphic illustration of this uh, when our prime minister, despite all the difficulties in India-Pakistan relations, uh, took the initiative to have a SARC uh, summit on uh, in the wake of the pandemic uh, in March, April uh, uh, last year. And uh, while uh, and, you know, uh, in which uh, uh, everyone agreed uh, that uh, governments need to cooperate much more at a regional uh, level, sub-regional level and regional level to address the issues arising from the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic. The Pakistanis, to some extent, were the naysayers uh, even there. But my, it really underscores the point which I made that the SARC has a narrative value uh, which you cannot uh, uh, cannot overlook. So I feel, I may be wrong, but in my view, at some stage, uh, the SARC uh, factor will again come back into uh, emphasis. Uh, and uh, it provides a certain uh, platform for developing regional cooperation, uh, which, may, which may give some useful results. Let me introduce two seemingly unlikely foreign policy subjects, uh, water and climate change. Uh, water because India uh, through riverine links uh, and because of the Himalayan uh, headland, if you will, are linked, uh, India's linked uh, through rivers with Pakistan, with Nepal, with Tibet slash China, with Bangladesh, with Bhutan, with even Myanmar to some extent. And also climate change because it affects uh, rising sea levels, it affects how uh, climate change is cropping patterns, really everything, uh, the res water reservoirs, everything. In, in, and of course, the deltaic region in the eastern uh, aspect of the subcontinent, which is really this huge, huge deltaic region, including the Sundarbans, also northeastern uh, India, which goes into Myanmar. So there's a very vast geographical aspect that is directly uh, related to water and, and climate change or climate issues at the very least. So Ambassador, uh, are water and climate change really the issues of the future, the foreign policy tables of the future? Uh, and it is, it is very certainly uh, in, uh, uh, I mean, if you look at India and Pakistan and the Indus Waters uh, Treaty, uh, the Indus Waters Treaty was one of the major breakthroughs in early diplomacy between India and, and Pakistan, whereby how river waters were to be shared uh, was an important achievement of uh, uh, 1950s uh, the diplomacy. Similarly with Bangladesh, uh, where you have had uh, uh, less success, but the uh, riverine issues are even more important to a great extent with, uh, with Nepal also, uh, also with Bhutan where hydropower uh, projects underwrite uh, so much of India-Bhutan relations. So yes, water is, uh, uh, extremely uh, important. But I think uh, the real challenge for the future is not to see uh, water or water-related issues in an instrumental sense, uh, so to say, but in a more futuristic uh, way, uh, which is uh, part of the wider uh, ecological and uh, climate change crisis that South Asia faces, and which really occupies very a very small space 
uh, in uh, South Asian diplomacy uh, today. Uh, South Asian diplomacy uh, is uh, you know, largely uh, defined by conventional issues, which is uh, political security related, trade and commerce uh, related. Uh, and to that extent, it's heavily securitized. Uh, I think uh, the, the challenge for the future is how do you desecuritize uh, uh, relationships in South Asia by bringing in issues such as water, climate change, uh, uh, groundwater uh, depletion, and a whole set of ecological uh, uh, issues, which actually now it is becoming quite clear, uh, require uh, much more regional cooperation and cannot be handled uh, uh, at a national level alone. Uh, the pandemic again shows that so many public health issues are trans-regional and cross-regional that uh, a national policy on its own will have limit will face limitations at some point of time uh, or the other so i think we uh, we really need to uh, look at water uh, not not simply in the way it was possible in the 1950s and 60s of how many cusacks to be released and uh, uh, which river is to be divided up but in a wider uh, context i mean how do you take a basin wide approach to uh, rivers i think this is central issue for India and Bangladesh in many ways, uh, even for India and Pakistan to some uh, extent, how do you use, how do you put into effect best conservation uh, practices? Uh, for India and Bangladesh, again, how do you use uh, inland water uh, transportation networks uh, much more effectively than you have been showing, uh, than you have been doing so far? I think these are the future issues uh, for South Asia uh, and we shouldn't let the security dominated or the conventional issues suck all the oxygen out of the room. What exactly does the Indian Council for World Affairs do uh, in terms of uh, studying foreign, Indian foreign policy or uh, reviewing it or even mapping it? Well, the Indian Council of World Affairs is a, a very good illustration of uh, the thinking which went into uh, the wider world and India's external uh, relations outside the government. So uh, in the early 1940s, it was set up by a group of uh, what we would today call uh, public intellectuals. Uh, at that time, they were regarded as being uh, uh, public service oriented individuals, but we would today call them public uh, uh, intellectuals. Uh, people like uh, Dr. Appadurai, uh, Kunzru, uh, Tej Bahadur, uh, Sapru, uh, and others who felt that uh, while the government would, of course, frame policy, it was important that they should be an independent, uh, research-oriented uh, discussion about Indian foreign policy outside the government, uh, and which is why they set up this uh, uh, institution, uh, and it was intended to have uh, three principal uh, uh, planks. Uh, uh, the first of which was uh, uh, research. Uh, the second was uh, debate and uh, discussion. Uh, and the third was uh, outreach. Uh, so research meant that you try to build up scholarship uh, in India. And at that time, in the 40s, 1940s, uh, uh, research on international relations in India was very weak, was at a very incipient uh, uh, stage. Uh, international relations, foreign policy, diplomacy was largely seen as an outshoot, uh, a small outshoot of uh, the Department of Political Science in most uh, universities. So the research aspect was important. Secondly, that there should be a platform for in which uh, people knowledgeably discuss uh, foreign policy and international affairs related uh, uh, issues and finally outreach meant that you should try to establish links with like-minded institutions uh, across uh, the world. So these three impulses came together uh, in the ICWA and it was founded in uh, 1943. Uh, by 1947, in March, April 1947, two months before our independence, uh, 
it had uh, gathered enough confidence to host a major conference, the first real international conference hosted in India, which was called the Asian Relations uh, Conference. Uh, and then through the 50s, uh, it concentrated on these three uh, aspects uh, uh, of its uh, mandate. So the first school of uh, international uh, studies was set up within the ICWA. That later on became, uh, that later on shifted away and joined the Jawaharlal Nehru University in the 1970s and became the School of International Studies. But it, when it was set up and when it developed and for the first uh, almost two decades of its existence, it was very much a part of the ICWA uh, and it was then called the Indian School of International Studies. Uh, and this specialized in what uh, was termed then area studies that you study different countries uh, in depth. That means you develop a, 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 a in-depth knowledge of these countries, polities, their histories, the languages, the culture, the economy, et cetera, et cetera. And really the ICWA uh, through the international, uh, through the Indian School of International Studies um, uh, gave this, uh, gave this uh, idea of concept of area studies in India, uh, some real depth and it sunk in pretty deep uh, roots. On outreach, similarly, it developed links with institutions all over the world, uh, but also what it tried to do uh, was to develop a debate in uh, all across India. And the founders of ICWA, and uh, I mean, this has been one of its guiding policies uh, up to now, that foreign policy is too important a subject to be left to the national capital alone. It should be debated everywhere. So the ICWA had many branches, you know, small ICWA chapters. Uh, at one stage, they had almost 35 or 40 of them, often many of them in uh, tier two, tier three, tier four uh, cities. That tradition also continues today in a changed uh, format. What we now have are, uh, uh, partnerships with universities, with think tanks uh, across uh, uh, the country. Uh, and uh, so this was the debate and discussion uh, part. And, uh, uh, and finally, the research element uh, has remained very strong, uh, very strong element of the ICWA's uh, functioning. So they publish many books. We have a journal called India Quarterly, which has been coming out mm -hmm. without a break since 1945. Uh, it's one of the best known foreign policy international affairs journals uh, in the world today. Uh, and uh, it is, uh, uh, it's, it's very much peer reviewed. It has an editorial board of consisting of some of the best minds uh, on, the, on the subject. So the ICWA is a wonderful example of uh, how an indigenous institution and the striking quality about the ICWA was its desire to keep itself at arm's length from the government. That, uh, that we should not be dependent on the government for our uh, functioning. Uh, and for a long period of time, it maintained that tradition till it became uh, in many ways unmaintainable. Uh, and finally, the government had to step in uh, to help it. And this it did by an act of parliament which declared the ICWA to be an institution of national importance uh, and to ensure that it does not get involved in party political uh, debates or does not take partisan uh, lines uh, or uh, and has a certain autonomous and independent uh, character. The chair of the ICWA is the vice president of India. Uh, and that really secures uh, for the council uh, its uh, autonomy, independence, uh, in its day-to-day uh, -day and regular function. Ambassador Raghavan, thank you so very much for engaging with the Making of Modern India initiative.